make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. Please follow along as we read the scriptures because I, when I get to the message, I'm not going to go through every verse. So please uh, follow along. Verse 22. Because on those days the Jews rid themselves of their enemies, and it was a month which was turned for them from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into a holiday, that they should make them days of feasting and rejoicing and sending portions of food to one another and gifts to the poor. For Haman, the son of Hamadetha, the Agagite, the adversary of all the Jews, had schemed against the Jews to destroy them and had cast poor, that is the lot, to, to disturb them and destroy them. Therefore, they called these days Purim, after the name of Pur. And because of the instructions in this letter, both what they had seen in this regard and what had happened to them, So these days were to be remembered and celebrated throughout every generation, every family, every province and every city. And these days of Purim were not to fail among the fail from among the Jews or their memory paid from their descendants. He sent letters to all the Jews, to the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Ahasuerus, namely, words of peace and truth. The command of Esther established these customs for Purim and it was written in the book. Let us pray. Our gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening. Father, we thank you for your wonderful word. Wonderful words of life are contained in it. We worship you, we praise you for your goodness that we don't have to rely on our feelings. You have a firm word, you have established in the heavens, you have given it to us in our hand, that we can go to it for light any time. We worship you, we praise you for your goodness, for giving us your beautiful word. Father, this evening as we open your word, we pray that you would speak to us through the verses before us. Father, teach us your truth, teach us your light, Teach us your truth. Give us your light. Let them lead us to thy holy hill. Let them lead us to heaven. Let them lead us to nearness to you. We ask you for help. Father, this uh, evening, please remember me. Please give me wisdom. Please give me utterance. Please give your people a seeing eye, a hearing ear, that they too may receive your truth. They too may be built up in the faith. We ask for your blessing upon our time together. Lord, unless you bless, all our efforts are waste. So we pray that you bless our time. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. 
So here we have a record of how the festival of Purim was instituted. Mordecai records these events. He, he selects a couple of days, verse 21, the 14th day and the 15th day of the month of Adar, which, which is sometime in March, according to our calendars. Um, so those days would be days of remembrance, days of memorial for this great deliverance that the Jews had experienced during their time. It was further affirmed, validated by Queen Esther's authority. And we see here a record of the institution of Purim, the festival. The enemy, Haman, decided to do one thing to destroy them, but God had intervened. God had reversed the course. God had uh, brought the evil he wanted to bring upon the Jews, upon himself and his followers and his um, cohorts. That's what we see here. This evening, as we look at this portion, what can we learn from this portion? The first heading I want to put before you is, as we look at this chapter, we would one of the themes of this chapter is the design of memorials. The design of memorials. A lot of Christians, a lot of people in the church struggle with what we may call things that God has given freedom with. We call it freedom of conscience. The Lord has allowed certain things. He has given freedom to our conscience. And we can celebrate, we can follow our conscience and we can celebrate them joyfully. For example, um, in certain churches, uh, Christmas is, anyone celebrating Christmas is looked upon as a traitor. A lot of Christian people struggle with that. Okay, Christmas is I'm, I'm, I'm celebrating the birth, the incarnation of my Savior, the Lord God who came into this world. Why am I looked up, down upon as if I'm sort of a traitor? A lot of Christian people struggle with that. If you look at the verses that we are looking at, such people have a clear justification that you can celebrate Christmas Day as long as you don't do it just for commercial purposes, but you are truly celebrating the reason for the season, which is God infinite has come into this world. If you notice in verse 20 onwards to the verse 32, uh, Brother Jaker already mentioned, there is no command that God had actually asked them to institute Purim, to institute this festival called Purim. Okay, everybody agrees there, right? Yes, everybody agrees. I can see all the nods. There is no institution whatsoever that Mordecai and Esther were ordered by God to institute this festival. They from the freedom of their own conscience, said, we must commemorate the deliverance of God. And they brought forth this idea to remember the works of God. Their goal was, this should be a memorial that in our time, we have seen a great deliverance. We want, we don't want to forget this. We want our contemporaries, our generation to know this, that God has intervened. God has given us deliverance. But they didn't want just their generation to know it. 
they wanted the future generations also to know it. Verse 28, so these days were to be remembered and celebrated throughout every, every, verse 28, every, these days were to be remembered and celebrated throughout every generation, not just their generation, but the subsequent generations as well. So here's the, for those of us who struggle with whether we should celebrate Christmas or not celebrate Christmas, the, God has given us freedom of conscience, right? If you do it for the right reasons, yes, you can. You are remembering the greatest event that has happened in history in the sphere of time. That God infinite had come into this world as a human being to save sinners. If you, if you have that truth and if it's, that is the substance and that is what you are commemorating, you have the freedom to do that. Or some might be convinced otherwise. Some might say, no, I don't want to remember. I, I, I don't want Christmas Day. Fine. You, that's your freedom of your conscience. And that's fine. But you should not go and say people who are celebrating Christmas are traitors. Right? So that's a matter of non-essential. Your, your conscience says you should not. Keep it to yourself. Who are you to condemn another servant? Right? Okay, uh, uh, let's uh, move on. So here we see this concept called design of memorials. Design of memorials. The question now is, what is the purpose of the memorials? I've already stated that. First, to remember the works of God in our own generation. To remember the works of God. We all suffer from a disease called sin. And one of the symptoms of that sin, uh, of that disease is, we are quick to forget the works of God and we are quick to remember all the garbage. We are quick to forget the works of God and quick to remember all the garbage. Right? Let me give you an example. If I ask you about a movie you watched as a six-year-old, you would remember it. But if I ask you what was last week's sermon, you would say, I have no idea. That's because of sin. Sin does that to us. The purpose of the memorial is, there is this physical thing in front of you that is tearing at you and pointing you to a truth. For example, the Lord's table is a memorial event. It is standing before you as a physical thing. It is pointing you to a spiritual truth that Christ died on our behalf on the cross of Calvary. If you believe in him, your sins are pardoned. You have the gift of eternal life. Your sins are remembered no more. That's a physical thing, the table, that it is pointing to this spiritual truth. Similarly, the purpose of the memorial is to do that. It is to go beyond that physical thing to a greater thing, to a greater truth. For example, in this case, the, the festival of Purim, down the line, someone, some second generation person would ask a parent, what is this festival, mom, Purim? Why are we celebrating this? The mom and dad would then sit and say, during the days of Esther and Mordecai, this is what happened. There was a guy by the name Haman. He wanted to destroy our people. God had affected a great deliverance. And that is why we are here. And it, this truth, through this festival of Purim, is passed on to the next generation. So, first thing, the purpose is to remember an event in our current generation. Second purpose is to pass on the truth to future generations. Now, what are the different forms these memorials can take? What are the different forms these memorials can take? 
there are many forms that these memorials can take. For example, in the chapter we are just reading, it takes two forms. It takes two forms. Let me see how many of us can guess. First form is, what is the first form? That is correct. There is a, uh, letters were sent and these letters were compiled later in a book. So the book was a memorial. What else? What else was served as a memorial for this deliverance? It's the obvious, so you're not telling me. The festival itself. Purim itself, right? The day in this case, Purim, the festival, served as a memorial. As we read verse 32, all these things, the command of Esther established these customs for Purim and it, were writ it was written in the book. There was also a book that recorded all this deliverance. So two things actually served in this case as memorials of God's works. Okay, But if you go through scripture, there, these memorials take different forms. One another form you will find is what we may call monuments. Monuments. Take for example, let us go to the book of uh, let us go to the book of Joshua. Joshua. We'll turn to chapter four. Joshua chapter four. Joshua chapter 4 verses 1 through 9, there is an event. The Jordan was in full flow. God said, did a miracle there. God did a work there. God told, let the priest set foot. Let them stand in the middle. Jordan will stop. Just as Joshua was instructed, Joshua instructed the priests, the priests were carrying the ark of God. What we see is the Jordan in full flow stopped so that the children of God would pass over. And this is what we see in verse 1. When all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord spoke to Joshua saying, Take for yourself twelve men from the people, one man from each tribe. Command them, saying, Take up for yourselves twelve stones from here out of the middle of Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet are standing firm, and carry them over with you and lay them down in the lodging place where you will lodge tonight. So Joshua called twelve men he had appointed from the sons of Israel, one man from each tribe. Joshua said to them, Cross again to the ark of the Lord your God in the middle of Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of Israel. Verse 6, let this be a sign among you, so that when your children ask later, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Verse 7, then you shall say to them, Because the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, so these stones shall become a memorial to the sons of Israel. For ever. This miraculous event at Jordan, it must, must not be erased from memory. It should not perish with the generation of Joshua. The future generations must know it. People in the 21st century must know it. This monument served that purpose. What do these 12 stones mean? It means God had worked out a miracle. So it takes the form of monuments. Let me give you another example from Joshua. And we can call this a monument or we can also call this an article. God sometimes uses special articles as memorials. Turn to the book of Joshua chapter 22. Joshua chapter 22. A little bit of background. The conquest is completed. The 
12 tribes have occupied the promised land. We're going to pick up in verses 21. 21. The tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Gad, and half tribe of Manasseh lived, if you will, on the south side in the Jordan. They came back after the conquest was complete. Joshua blessed them. He said, you did not forsake your brothers. You were not selfish. You could have just, because you occupied your land, you could have just stayed home. But you didn't do that. You are not selfish. You came. You helped your brothers. You helped them conquer the land. The war, the conquest is complete. Go, go back to your land now. Go back to your families. Have rest. So these, uh, these two and a half tribes, Reuben, Gid, and Manasseh, they go back. And they do something very interesting. They build an altar. The nine and a half tribes hear this, that an altar not prescribed in the law of God has been built. They take up their arms. They say, you know, the, the, these two and a half tribes, they are committing treason. They are disobeying the law of God. The wrath of God is going to come upon us because these two and a half tribes are disobeying the word of God. God did not sanction this altar. But these two and a half tribes are instituting an altar, perverting the worship of God. God's wrath is going to come upon us. Let us address this ourselves. Let us wipe out the two and a half tribes. So the nine and a half, I'm assuming it's nine and a half. Nine and a half. Nine and a half plus two and a half is twelve. So that's good. Nine and a half tribes come to come to war. And there's this interesting conversation. We pick it up in verse 21. Then the sons of Reuben, sons of Gad, and half tribe of Manasseh answered and spoke to the heads of the families of Israel. Verse 22 The mighty one God, the Lord, the mighty one God, the Lord, he knows. And may Israel itself know. If it was in rebellion or if in an unfaithful act against the Lord, do not save us this day. In other words, what they are saying is, if you are unfaithful to the Lord, don't save us. We are, we are worthy to be killed. We are worthy to be exterminated. Verse 23, if we built us an altar to turn away from following the Lord, or if to offer a burnt offering or grain offering on it, or if to offer sacrifices of peace offerings on it, the Lord God himself require it. Verse 24, but truly we have done this out of concern for a reason. In other words, what they are saying is, we are not unfaithful. We have this, we have this altar for a reason. And they go on to explain the reason. In time to come, your sons may say to our sons, What have you to do with the Lord, the God of Israel? In other words, these people were thinking far ahead. They were concerned about their coming generations. In the future, Nine and a half tribes must might say, you're not our brothers. We don't know you. You have no portion to worship with us. They might say that. Verse 25, why? Because there's a geographical boundary. For the Lord God has made Jordan a border between us and you. You have no portion in the Lord. So your sons may make our sons stop fearing the Lord. So, these two and a half tribes would be cut off from the worship of Yahweh. These two and a half tribes would lose reverence for the Lord. We see this as a potential danger. That our children might be cut off from the worship of the true and living God. Verse 26, Therefore we said, Let us build an altar, not for burnt offering, 
not for sacrifice rather it shall be a witness between us and you and between our generations after us so that we are to perform the service of the lord before him with our burnt offerings with our sacrifices with our peace offerings so that your sons will not say to our sons in time to come you have no portion in the lord so these people are explaining we want to avoid our children cast away from worshiping the lord so we built this altar as a proof that in the future your children will know we too have a portion in the privilege in worshiping the living and true god this altar would serve as a witness so again we see this article this altar serving a witness that these two and a half tribes also have a portion in the worship of yahweh was 34 the sons of ruben the sons of gad called the altar witness for they said it is a witness between us that the lord is god so they were not just worried about future generations but they were also talking to their contemporaries to the altar they are saying this is a witness that the lord is god we shall serve the lord god only so memorials take different forms books calendar days monuments articles these are some of the forms it takes and what is their purpose again to know the works of god in our current generation and in the generation to come there are for example some people some men very well well intended well meaning men well intended men they would say for example don't read anything outside the bible don't read anything outside the bible let's say there's a book on welsh revival don't read it let's say there's a book on a, a, a great man of god like let's say edwards jonathan edwards don't read it it is well intended but it is against uh against i, I would say against common sense well intended but against common sense by not reading of the revivals what are we saying we are not interested in the work of god in the past what he has done in the early 20th century or the or the 19th century we don't want to read a man like edwards the same reason we are not interested we are not interested what god did through this great man or you can take for that matter even brother buck singh we are not interested in knowing some of us are acquainted with brother buck singh i'm sure the next uh, generation or the their gen, the following generation second generation from now they will not know brother buck singh if you were to tell them don't read anything outside the bible we are doing them a great disservice these books are memorials of the works of god in our generation and they must be passed on memorials serve a purpose to remind ourselves of god's work in our generation and to remind to preserve the truth of the works of god in the generations to come so all of us should should have memorials as individuals we should have memorials when you have an answered prayer you should have a memorial you have to write it somewhere perfect the best place to do it is in your bible itself you 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 saw a promise of god you prayed about it god answered it just make a note in your bible 
I prayed this. God answered. How does it help you? Next time when I, you come to that place, when you're reading that, that, that note that you yourselves have written, it stimulates you to trust God, to pray. You must do that. I must do that. We must have memorials in the forms of, in the form of uh, special days, for example. All of many of us celebrate birthdays for our kids. Praise be to the Lord. It's, God is faithful. But we have to be careful why we celebrate birthdays. We celebrate birthdays not to exalt our children, but to exalt the Lord God who is faithful, who has preserved them. Our center of our center of attraction must not be our children, but the God who has given us the children, who has preserved them, right? So, let's say our kids hit 14th birthday. That day is a day that God, in His mercy, has preserved my child. We're giving thanks to God. It's a memorial day. Wedding anniversaries. It's not about us. It's about the God who has kept two sinners together. Having a marriage, living together, is a difficult thing between two sinners. If we are together, our marriages, it is because of the hand of God. And we must give glory to God, not to ourselves. Church anniversaries, I've seen, I, and I say this with pain. A lot of churches, we are celebrating our 25th anniversary. We are celebrating our 50th anniversary. It's all about man. It's not about the Lord God who had preserved them for 25 years or 50 years. Church anniversaries must also happen as memorial events to the faithfulness, to the goodness of God. So it's very important to remember the goodness of God through these memorials. We have what is called Reformation Sunday. What is the purpose of Reformation Sunday? Nowhere it is prescribed in the Bible. You guys go and celebrate Reformation Sunday or Reformation Day. It's not prescribed in the Bible. Why do we do that? Again, it's not because we love some Luther or we love some some reformer. No. The gospel has been lost. God had intervened. He has pierced through the darkness once again. He, the gospel has been recovered through a mighty move of God. And that's why we commemorate the Reformation Sunday. It is to remember. These memorials have one purpose only. To remember the works of God. To remember the faithfulness of God. And all these memorials have one purpose. They are physical, but they point us to the God who has made these things possible, the, the, the memorials possible. As we look at this chapter, we see the memorial of Purim, the design, the design of a memorial. Every memorial has a certain substance to it. It has a matter to it. The memorial points us to that matter, to that substance. The memorial doesn't stop in itself. It doesn't stop in the physical event, but rather points us to a truth, points us to something pertaining to God, a work of God. What is it that in this chapter, it is pointing to. It is pointing to two things. Two things. Number one, because, verse 22, these days, the 14th day and the 15th day of the month of Adar was celebrated annually, verse 22, for this purpose. Because on those days, the Jews rid themselves of their 
enemies. What is the purpose of this memorial? What is the purpose of memorial uh, of Purim? It is a reminder of the destruction of the enemies of God. It is serving the purpose of the destruction of the enemies of God, of all those who stand against God and His purposes. Mordecai and Esther wanted their generation, future generation to know this, this truth. Anyone who stands against God and His people will be dealt with by God. They will be punished. One of the things that is recorded is the hanging, not just of Haman, but also the hanging of Haman's sons. The destruction not just of Haman who orchestrated the plot, but the hanging of Haman's sons. This even would serve, serve this purpose. The enemies of God and their children will perish because they have acted against God and His purposes. That is the truth that they want to convey. Dear ones, this is the truth throughout scripture. The Purim reminds us that the enemies of God will fall. They may temporarily be prosperous, but they will ultimately fall. They will be brought down to the dust. They will be destroyed in their own vices, in their own schemes. The enemies of God would be destroyed. What is the entire Bible? The entire Bible is this. In fact, the entire of human history is this. It is a conflict between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Remember what Genesis 3.15 says? What God said to, to, to what God said to the serpent, the Lord God said to the serpent. Verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise, on, bruise you on the head, you shall bruise him on the heel. The whole of human history is recorded for us in verse 15. There will be two lines. The devil's line. The Messiah's line. There is going to be this conflict. There is going to be this enmity between the devil's line and the Messiah's line. The devil would bruise the heel of the Messiah and his line. In other words, he, the devil will always create some hurt to, to the Messiah's line, meaning the people of God. In other words, the people of God would be persecuted. The people of God would suffer. It is going to happen. He, you shall bruise him on the heel. There is going to be some effect on the children of God. But they are not, they don't perish. On the other hand, what happens to the line, the line of the uh, devil, the line of Satan? They shall be bruised on their head. They shall perish. This is the entire story of human of humans. Anyone who is on the side of God will suffer. In the side of the Messiah will suffer in this world. But he is not ultimately destroyed. 
but the the those who are serving the devil will be ultimately destroyed we can see this illustrated throughout the bible take take for example in exodus the book of exodus the children of god who were in uh, who were in egypt did they suffer for a while did they suffer yes they did suffer was pharaoh prosperous yes he was prosperous but there came a moment when the right time came what happened the children of god were delivered from egypt what happened to pharaoh and his mighty army destroyed destroyed in the red sea this is repeated uh, in the book of esther we see haman and his generation destroyed we see the early church who were the persecutors of the early church who were the first persecutors of the early church no, it were not the romans in case you are saying the romans no it's not the romans who were the first persecutors of the christian church the jews right so what do we see what does the apostle paul say about these jews turn turn with me to first thessalonians first thessalonians chapter 2 we're going to read verse 14 onwards for you brethren he's talking to the thessalonian christians became imitators of the churches of god in christ jesus that are in judea for you also endured the same sufferings at the hand of your own countrymen just as the judean christians suffered from the jews who both killed the lord jesus and the prophets and drove us out they are not pleasing to god but hostile to all men hindering us from speaking to the gentiles so that they may be saved with the result that they always fill up the measure of their sins but wrath has come upon them to the utmost what the apostle is saying is wrath has come upon the jews to the utmost why because they were persecuting the messiah's line the, the people of god the early christians and 70 ad what happened jerusalem was destroyed jewish nation put aside as we go on when we read the book of revelation how is it going to end this is how it's going to end turn with me to the book of revelation what happens to the enemies of god the book of revelation chapter 19 was was 20 chapter 19 verse 20 the beast and the beast was seized with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image and these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone and the rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse and all the birds were filled with their flesh so here he is is talking about the beast the false prophet the picture of all the garments that persecute christians a picture of false religion that persecutes christians what happens to these we read they were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone what happened to the devil what happened to the devil revelation 2010 the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet were also and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever the picture is all the enemies of god ultimately in 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 the final analysis what happens all those who stand up against god and his people here it is revelation 2010 they are punished they are tormented day and night forever and ever this evening we have to ask ourselves a question 
as we consider the enemies of God. Are you an enemy of God? Are you in sin? Are you in sin? If you are in sin, you are an enemy of God. If you have not committed your life to God, life to the Lord Jesus, if you ask, did not ask for pardon of your sins, you are an enemy of God. You might be young, but you have not given your heart to the Lord Jesus. If you have not trusted the Lord Jesus, if you not turned to God and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You are living as an enemy of God. He offers you free salvation. You are saying, no, I don't want free salvation. I don't want my sins pardoned. I want to live in rebellion against you. Here is a warning for you. Just as Haman and his descendants were destroyed, you too will be destroyed if you continue as an enemy of God. Today is the day of salvation. Come to him today. Say, I'm sorry, I'm living in rebellion against you, Almighty God. Please pardon my sins. Please be merciful to me. This God will be merciful to you and you will not perish. You will have the gift of eternal life. What else is the design of this memorial in uh, Luke cha in Esther chapter ch chapter 9? What else is the design? The, 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 the first purpose is, it is a reminder that the enemies of God and their future generations would be destroyed because they are standing in opposition to God. What else is the purpose of the memorial? The second purpose is this. It is the deliverance of the people of God. It is the deliverance of the people of God. Again, verse 22. I'm going to uh, read halfway through. And it was a month which was turned for them from sorrow into gladness, from mourning into a holiday, that they may that they should make them days of feasting and rejoicing and sending portions of food to one another and gifts to the poor. So here were these people. Uh, uh, a decree was passed. All who belong to the Jewish race on this particular day will be put to death will be executed. God had put Queen Esther, Hadasha, in the palace. God had effected salvation through this young woman. The decree now is to, that the Jews could take up weapons and defend themselves. They could be delivered from this from this decree of destruction. They experienced salvation. They experienced deliverance through the work of Esther, through the work of Mordecai. It's a remembrance, it's a reminder of the deliverance of the people of God. It reminds us of the power of God. This deliverance reminds us of the power of God. You remember Esther, how did she go to the king? Do you think she went confidently? The king is going to listen to me today because I am his queen. Do you think she did that? No, she was not called into the court. She was not called. She was risking her life when she entered the court. Proverbs 21 1 says, The heart of the kings is like rivers of water. The Lord diverts it whichever way he wants. The Lord exercised his power on this mighty, mighty monarch, changed his heart so that he would be favorable to Esther. The power of God in touching this mighty monarch. 
brought about deliverance to the to the Jews, to the children of God in this instance. God's works, God's deliverance display his power. Pharaoh was following the children of Israel. He had a change of mind. I let them go. They're going to go free. Impossible. I want them as slaves again. So he gets his mighty army ready. He's coming after them. Children of Israel are before Red Sea. On one side there is the Red Sea. On one side there is Pharaoh's army. What happens? God effected salvation. Moses says, today you will see the salvation of the Lord. And God's mighty power breaks open the Red Sea. So that the children of God, instead of being destroyed in the Red Sea, walk through the Red Sea to life. God's deliverance changes the Red Sea, which is an instrument of death, now into an instrument of life, helps the children to get to the other side. Shedrach, Moshek, Meshek, Abednego. Thrown, they were they were being made ready to be thrown into the fire. The king is really mad at them. He says, "Ignite the fire to the maximum extent possible, to the point that the workers near the near the furnace were being destroyed." An instrument of death, this this mighty furnace, God displays his power in rescuing these three young men. Instead of destroying, this fire destroying, this fire preserves the power of God in display. God's deliverances put forward the power of God. The mighty things can be touched by God. The king's heart may be touched by God. This mighty Red Sea can be touched by God. This mighty furnace, God can touch it. God can use it as an instrument of salvation. In the deliverance of people of God, God many times uses unusual means of unusual means. We would not, we are not expecting that and God in his wisdom uses this unusual means of salvation. He is a specialist at this. He can work through the mightiest. He can work through the most insignificant. We read of uh, in Egypt, as Israelites were multiplying, Pharaoh was envious. You know, if if the Jews multiply, they are going to side with my enemies and they are going to fight against me. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to arrange a campaign of genocide. I'm going to arrange a, a campaign of infanticide. I'm going to re get rid of all the Jewish babies. Where does God bring salvation from in the, in that scenario? Not through Moses. Moses is still Moses is still not born. They want to eradicate Moses too. Midwives. Most insignificant. The names are recorded for us in Exodus 115. Anybody remembers? Right. Two insignificant women. God's means of salvation to preserve the Jewish race, to preserve the line of Messiah. A champion by the name Goliath comes, cha challenging the armies of the living God. What is his means of salvation? What is God's means of salvation? What is God's means of deliverance? A young man, a young boy called David, a shepherd, not trained for war. All he knows is shepherding the sheep. God's ways of salvation in the most unusual places. A wicked minister by the name Haman rises up, wants to eradicate the Jews. What is God's way of salvation? 
a servant by the name Mordecai, a gatekeeper by the name Mordecai, a young woman by the name Hadassah or Esther. Most unusual, where we are not looking, God provides salvation there. God desires to provide salvation to mankind. Where is the deliverance? In the most unusual place. The cross is an instrument of punishment. The cross was, was looked upon with shame. Anyone on the cross was looked with contempt. It is insulting. But God, in his wisdom, takes the most unusual places. Most, we won't even think salvation will come from there. He takes those places, in this case, the crucified Messiah, the weak Messiah, God's own son, on a cross, which is an instrument of contempt, shame. And he says, this is where I am going to put salvation for mankind. This God works through the mightiest things. This God, in his wisdom, works through the most contemptible things. His deliverances, his ways are beyond finding out. This should give us hope to trust him. God can use the most unusual things, the more things that you are not expecting in your wildest dreams. God can use them to bring deliverance to you. And God's salvation most times is all of a sudden. It's, it's as if your adrenaline is going up, 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 up. It's almost you're going to burst up. Suddenly God intervenes and says, here's the moment of salvation. I'm going to reverse the entire course. Here were these Jewish people, uh, Esther's and Mordecai's contemporaries. They were at the verge of death. They were fasting, they were praying, they were in sorrow that they were going to be murdered, they were mourning. What happens? All of a sudden, suddenly, their sorrow is turned into gladness, their mourning is, is turned into deliverance. This Purim reminds not only the destruction of God's enemies, but the deliverance of God through the most unusual means and through suddenly God can intervene. How is salvation possible? Here is a sinner sinned all his life. Guilt all over him. A cloud of guilt all over him. He can't even pray. He doesn't even know how to pray. The guilt is upon him. He comes to the foot of the cross and he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus, save me. Remember me when you come in your kingdom. Suddenly, what happens? The promise comes. Today, you will be with me in paradise. God's salvation is like that. Instantly, the worst sinner, the worst sinner, the moment he comes to the cross, suddenly he is justified through the Lord Jesus Christ. By grace, through faith, we are saved suddenly, immediately. Just as like that thief on the cross was saved. Oh, the matchless ways of God's salvation. Dear ones, this evening, again I ask the question, have you experienced the deliverance, this salvation, this justification that God gives to you freely? If you haven't, to come to Him. He's in a moment going to change your mourning into dancing, your sorrow into gladness. He's going to give you the gift of eternal life immediately. As we close this evening, 
I want to challenge all of us as believers. Yes, we have received salvation of the Lord. But in our life, there will come days where we have to make a choice. We have to make a choice between standing for the truth, standing for God, and compromise with the world. And thus joining hands with the world. This is this choice. It's going to come. For every believer it's going to come. Standing faithful to the Lord. Being in his people. Or following the ways of the world. Compromise. Standing for the truth will bring persecution. The pressure will be on on you. On me. If you were tested, whose side will you be on? Whose side will you be on? If we persevere under trial, yes, we will temporarily suffer, but in the long run we win. On the other hand, if we go to the other camp, we are destroyed forever. And in the long run, those who stand and uh, persevere under trial would be victorious. I am almost tempted to tell you a story. There is a man by the name Machen. You must have heard his name, John Gresson Machen. Machen was an early 20th century Christian. He was a professor in Princeton Seminary. He was a valiant warrior for the truth. He, he's a, he belonged to a denomination that was going astray. It was embracing what we call liberalism. They were, there was a camp in his Princeton University that was saying, the scripture is not the word of God. He stood up and said, no, that's not true. The scriptures are the word of God. In, in long story short, he stood firm. He was opposing professors at his college. He was opposing people in his denomination, saying the Bible is the word of God. These other, this, the second group that said the scriptures are not, the truth, they cannot be relied upon. It's not inherent. This is what they did. Machen, we are going to defrock you. Defrocking means we are going to unpastor you. We are going to take off your pastoral credentials. We are going to take off your prof professor credentials. We are going to strip you of your livelihood. And they did that. They did it to Professor Machen. Here was a man stripped off his livelihood. But he was willing to give up everything because he believed the word of God is inherent. The Lord used this man. He started a seminary. Uh, this this merchant started a seminary. Most of us would be familiar. It's called the Westminster Seminary. In Philadelphia in Southern California, this and it, it sends pastors who believe the Bible is the word of God. All of us at some point, we may not be tested like Machen, but we will be tested on, on the truth of the Bible. It's easy to compromise and go to the other camp. It's difficult to stay in the truth. If we Join the enemies of God. We can be sure in the long run we are destroyed. In the short run, yes, we are persecuted. But the ultimate victory is the lambs, is Christ. And we will, because of him, win. The question this evening is, whose side will you be on when the pressure is on? Will you stand for the truth or will you compromise? May the Lord give us grace.
that we would wholly firm, hold firm to the truths we have received and we will stand on the Lord's side. We will be willing to give up our life for truth's sake. Ultimately, the victory belongs to the Lord, belongs to his people. Let us ask the Lord this evening grace that we may stand firm in the truth. Let us pray. Father, we come to you this uh, evening, O oh Lord. We thank you for this memorial Purim. It reminds us the enemies of, this, of God would be destroyed forever. It reminds us of the deliverance of the people of God. We may suffer temporarily, but in the long run we win. O oh God, give us grace that we would not be people who are just focused on this world only, but we are people who have eternity stamped on our hearts, that we would have an eternal perspective and we would be willing to suffer for truth's sake in this world. If we are to lose our lives for the gospel's sake, give us the grace to lose our life for the gospel's sake. Give us grace, O oh God, that we may love the Lord Jesus, we may love the truth of your scriptures, we may fight for it, we may contend for it all the rest of our lives. Help us, O oh Lord, to preserve under trial. We ask you for help. Lord, Lord, help us, O oh Lord. Help us to be faithful, just like Mordecai and Esther were faithful. Give us grace, O oh Lord. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.